Um, so let me just introduce myself. So that's me and basically the introduction that uh, Pete provided is, is summarized here, so let me skip through that. I also just wanted to quickly mention Galvanized Data Engineering Immersive Program. So we have a couple of people who graduated from it sitting in the back. And uh, it's just a couple of blocks down the street. Uh, we cover Spark, Hadoop, Kafka, Storm, and, uh, and we're constantly looking at new technologies as well that have an uptake in the market and we'll, we'll include them in the curriculum. Um, here's just a little matrix of all the different things we cover. And uh, this is, if you want more information, just go to Galvanize or talk to me, or uh, if you have any other questions. So, so let's get into the talk. So that's like a little soft pitch I have to do in order to be uh, up here. Uh, so otherwise I'll get in trouble with Jared. <laughs> so, the, uh, so the talk today is about Apache Kudu. So you, know, you might, as uh, Pete was wondering, you're probably wondering as well, what is, what is a Kudu? What, what exactly is Apache Kudu? And then how can we use this? Like what, what, is, it, what is it all about? So I just wanted to get an idea of where people are at just so I can kind of uh, talk at the right level. So uh, how many people here are familiar with HDFS? Uh, pretty much everybody, okay, good. Uh, and then what about HBase? All right, good. So, so you, in some ways, you actually already know exactly how Kudu works. You, you basically just take those two things, put them together, and that's, that's Kudu. So, and then Kudu, I think uh, Pete did a little survey and there was one person who has left. So I think that's, at this point, we, have, uh, uh, we, we don't have a lot of uh, kudu uh, experts. Uh, so this is a kudu, and it's a kind of antelope that is found in Eastern and Southern Africa. And I think uh, the motivation behind the name is it's something that's fast. So it's fast and lean. And so in order to get to what problem it's trying to solve, there's really two different concepts we have to touch on first. The first is latency and the other is throughput. So latency is basically how long it takes for something to start up. So you might have something that goes really fast, but if it takes it a while to start up, sometimes it's not a good choice. And so in that case, it has a high latency. Uh, so between airplanes and cars, which would you say has a higher latency? Airplanes, airplanes yeah. So uh, cars have a lower latency, so the winner is cars. I mean, generally, you're looking for lower latency. Lower is better. Higher is worse. So um, the throughput is the opposite. So higher throughput is better. Lower is worse. And throughput is, conceptually, it's like how much can you get done within a unit of time. So it could be number of operations per minute or per second, but it could just be the amount of work. And so let's just continue with the same analogy. If you just think of work as like people getting transported, which has higher throughput, airplanes or cars? So airplanes. airplanes, right? And so airplanes definitely have higher throughput and they transport more people uh, over longer distances than cars can in the same amount of time. And so you can see this is a little matrix. So you have cars here, airplanes here. So cars have low latency, but also low throughput. Airplanes have high latency, so you have to it takes some time to like get through all the lines and everything, but then every, once you're in, things go really fast. And the jetpacks might be like high throughput. So th these, this is like the perfect sweet spot where you can just strap them on and just fly to LA. And then horses might be, take a while to like saddle up and they're also gonna be slower than cars. So this is kind of the, the worst uh, corner on the matrix. And uh, generally, it's not the case that one is better and the other is worse, and it really depends on what your goal is. So if you're, if you're going to Oakland, generally driving is going to be what you want to do, and then you, so you, you're fine with uh, low throughput. Uh, you care more about low latency, but then if you're going to Florida, you want to fly. So now let's step back. So just keep those two things in mind, and then let's just step back to see why HBase exists, what problems it solves that HDFS had, and then also why uh, Parquet exists. And so basically, Kudu is a combination of uh, HBase and Parquet. So HBase exists because HDFS is immutable. So it doesn't let you modify records or data once you've written it out. So you can only append to it. And also, it doesn't, HDFS doesn't let you read and write 
uh, doesn't do random access very fast. So HBS lets you access any key that you want and get the value. Also, it lets you do uh, modifications to the data. So it has low latency, whereas HDFS has high latency, right? So it takes a while to set things up. Uh, and then Parquet is another technology that it's basically a file format that sits on top of HDFS. And the main idea here is columnar storage. So you want to store by columns. So this lets you scan through the data very fast. Uh, it has high throughput, which is good. So once, you're, once you've set your MapReduce job up, it's going to go really fast once the data starts coming in. Uh, but the latency is also high, because HDFS just takes a while to set things up. You have to talk to the name node and uh, talk to various different nodes over the network. And so this is essentially the same matrix. So Parquet has high throughput but high latency. And then HBase has low latency but relatively low throughput. So if you ever run Hive on HBase, it's much slower than Hive on HDFS. Uh, so Kudu kind of sits in this corner, or the generally it's worse than both of these in their areas of strength. But it's good enough in both of those areas. And then in addition to that, it also is gives you both things at the same time. And then uh, this is just something that is on HDFS, maybe not as efficient as Parquet. Would give you high latency, but also lower throughput than Parquet. So one way to think about uh, Kudu is that it's HBase with columnar storage. So imagine HBase, except uh, under the hood, instead of storing your data in these really wide uh, rows, you're storing it in columnar parquet-like storage. So what this means is you can scan through the data much faster than you can with HBase. So you can essentially run MapReduce against Kudu and get similar speeds to parquet. And at the same time, think of you can also think of Kudu as like mutable parquet. So you're storing this columnar data, but you can also modify records. And you also have random access read-write. So it's kind of like a parquet-like HBase or HBase-like parquet. And so there is a specific use case, and there's, there's a reason this comes up a lot. So a lot of times you have systems where you have data that's uh, historical, that's sitting there, and then you have data that's coming in in real time, and you want to be able to integrate them. And so frequently what happens is you end up with something like a Lambda architecture where you have the data that's real time is sitting in HBase because that's faster to write to, and then the data that's uh, Historical is sitting in HDFS and possibly in a parquet format. And so with Kudu, you can, by combining both of these things, you can essentially use Kudu to store all of your data as well as to, uh, in real time, as well as your historical data. And so you have all of your data in the same place, and then you can run queries on it, combining data from both of those sources. And so it has fast columnar scans, so it competes with Parquet there. Also, it has low latency random access, so it competes with HBase. Uh, so this is kind of a little picture that shows where it stands. So it's not quite as good as either one of these, but it's, it does a trade-off between them. So you end up with decent performance on both of these axes. And also, it's written in C++. This is wrappers for Java and Python. It's very early, so it's, it's beta. I'm going to do a little demo at the end, so it does work. But, it's, uh, but many of the pieces are still promises. Like if you go through their documentation, they have little asterisks or, uh, next to things. But I still think it's worth keeping an eye on. And it's good to know what, what's going on with this, because it has a lot of potential. Yeah. Uh, when do you think it would be ready for production? Yeah, you know, this is something that. Uh, so I used to work at Cloudera so with some of the people on this. And I think with open source software, it's, nobody can estimate it, let, let alone people who are not even working on the code. So I, I have no idea. But I think even the people who are actually doing check-ins on GitHub have no idea when it will have those features. But they have, they have some kind of a timeline. And I think it will depend on how many people contribute and how much traction it gets. <laughs> I, know, I, I think your guess is going to be as good as mine. But Maybe, a, I, I, let me just say a year. Why not? <laughs> Hopefully, no one's recording this. So, yeah. To that point, the last time I checked, there were like five or seven contributors right. around there. Has that grown recently? I think they recently you know, did a big release. And at the same time, it is 
somewhat usable, so I think it's not pos probably useful, uh, stable enough to be in production, but you can uh, start experimenting with it. So I feel like, I think it's gaining more traction. So I see more activity in, on the mailing list and on their uh, community sites. Uh, so here are some benchmarks. And so you can see that with Parquet, it's a little bit worse on these uh, TPCH uh, benchmark uh, numbers. And so this is a, um, uh, so Kudu is uh, orange and lower is better. So in, on some of these benchmarks, it's lower, but on some it's uh, slightly higher. So it's basically on, about on par with uh, Parquet but possibly slightly worse. And then with HBase, it's, uh, we're comparing throughput. And so in throughput as well, it's, uh, HBase is better, so CUDA is not quite as good. So it's basically like just bad at everything, but it's, it's slightly bad instead of being really bad, which HBase and um, HDFS are by themselves. Uh, and then this is an interesting uh, uh, chart because this compares uh, Kudu against Phoenix. So Phoenix is the fastest SQL you can get on HBase. So it's, it's written, it was written by Salesforce and it's, part, it's an Apache project now, but it, it's really intended to kind of use all the tricks uh, that HBase provides in order to squeeze as much performance out of uh, SQL as possible. And so on um, comparing Kudu with Phoenix uh, and with Parquet on HDFS, uh, you can see that, and Impala is being used for Kudu and Parquet, so, um, so Phoenix and Kudu are about, uh, have about the same performance. I mean, in some cases, Kudu is actually slightly better. And then Parquet is, is significantly better on SQL-like uh, processing. But Kudu is, is actually comparable to Parquet in most of these. So this is a, a primary use case for why Kudu uh, where Kudu would make sense. So generally, if you're just using it for storage, HDFS will work fine. But when you have uh, real-time data and historical data, then in the past, without Kudu, you essentially have these two parallel systems, and you have to integrate the data between them if you want to run a query against uh, the newer data and the older data. So the and actually, let me just move on to this uh, use case. So for example, if you're an online retailer, you want to both look at what products have been selling for the last week and last month, but you also want to know what's selling today. So there might be a sudden rush on a specific product. So you want to make sure you pick up on that. And uh, you want to keep track of inventory so you can resupply and maybe place more orders. But at the same time, you also want to show the more popular products on top of your uh, bestsellers page, so people buy more of the hot selling product instead of assuming your site doesn't offer it. So in this case, you have historical data which you don't want to throw away. You don't want to just completely be, uh, be at the whim of like the fad that's going on in the last 10 minutes, but you also don't want to be completely stuck with uh, trends that stretch out over you know, the last month or last year. Uh, and so you want to integrate both of these sources. So you end up with the historical data being in HDFS and the real-time data being in uh, HBase, and then your queries have to merge both of those uh, data sets together. So with Kudu, you can essentially merge them into Kudu, and in fact, uh, so before Kudu, you'd have two parallel architectures, but then with Kudu, you can just store your historical data in Kudu as well as your real-time incoming data into Kudu, and then your architecture actually becomes a lot more streamlined, so you don't have to even know what Lambda architecture was, and it can just, just turn into like this sort of bad memory of, of, of an architecture that people once used to, used to use. So your data just comes in, and you just run queries on Kudu. Uh, so let's see. I think we're doing OK on time, so I'll just go into the internals a little bit. And uh, so this is the architecture of Kudu. Now, one of the first things about Kudu is that it does not sit on HDFS. So HBase is a layer on top of HDFS that gives you mutability. So you can write uh, rows into HBase and then modify them. And all of that happens in memory, or it keeps a log of, of the changes. And so when you do a query, you get the latest value of your, of your cells. So Kudu doesn't 
depend on H HDFS. It actually writes directly to disk. So it's, it's, a, it's in fact independent of uh, Hadoop. It can just run by itself without Hadoop. Uh, and also, in fact, the architecture has some similarities with Kafka. So you have a, there's a master tablet, and then there's all these uh, tablet servers, which are kind of like region servers from HBase. Uh, and then there's a mass, there's a leader and follower uh, paradigm that, that it uses for replication. So let's talk about the master first. So the master has some fault tolerance. You can have multiple masters. Uh, the other masters do not respond to requests from clients. They're just there to be a backup in case the leader master fails. Or, uh, fails. And so in that case, they'll, uh, they'll elect a, a new leader, and then that's going to serve client requests. Uh, so they follow the leader, and then whatever updates the leader makes to its metadata, they uh, make as well. And Raft is a protocol that they use both for electing leaders as well as for maintaining consistency. Uh, so here are some of the roles that the master has. So it keeps track of the metadata, figures out who's alive, and then also keeps track of the tablets. So regions are called tablets, going back to the terminology of like a big table from Google. Um, and so all the regions are basically tablets, and these are all tablet servers. So one of the differences between HBase and Kudu is that the tables are statically partitioned into tablets. So when you do a create table command, at that point, you specify how many tablets you're going to have. So it doesn't increase the number of regions or decrease based on how much data there is. So you have to kind of make a decision right at the beginning. Also, you can choose replication factors of three and five. And uh, the uh, replication, again, uses the leader follow-up pattern for consensus. So the leader is the only one who's allowed to write. And so anytime the leader accepts a write request, it uh, propagates it to its followers. And then if everyone reaches a consensus, then they accept that write. And then otherwise, uh, the write fails. Uh, the followers are able to serve read requests, but not uh, write requests. So yeah, so the writes must be done on the, on the leader. Actually, I think there's a typo here. And then uh, reads can be on leaders or followers. Uh, and then basically, they only replicate the write log. So everybody keeps writing all modifications. And then each tablet server is responsible for this, maintaining the state in a combination of memory and disk on its own. So they don't need to worry about replicating all of that. Uh, the client has metadata about which tablet lives where, so it just automatically talks to the leader for the uh, tablet that it wants to modify. And if it's wrong, then it'll just, at that point, it refreshes its cache. Uh, on the, the internals are uh, similar to HBase as well. So basically, you have these, uh, there's a memory. Uh, each tablet has uh, a piece where it stores, uh, a component where it stores uh, rows in memory, and then uh, periodically it compacts them out to disk, and then over time these get compacted as well. And now each time, the, if there's a modification on any of these rows that have already been written out to disk, then there's a delta mem, mem store which keeps track of that in memory, and then, so it, it tries to keep all the, uh, all the records for a specific row in the same disk row set, which includes deltas as well as the initial Right, uh, and there's a there's a Kudu paper that's white paper that's on their site that goes into all the details of the internals. Also, the tablets are based on the static partition that you do right at the beginning. So you can either uh, specify a hash partition, or you can also do a range partition. So we'll try the range partition in a demo, like shortly. So I think this will make more sense. But you can either just hash some of your columns into partitions so then they get uh, hashed out or they, uh, or the partitioning can be done by, uh, you can send some keys to a specific partition and meaning a specific tablet. And so Kudu does not require Hadoop nor HDFS and uh, it, does, it has no dependency on any of these pieces. At the same time, uh, the easiest way to interact with it is through Impala. So they've, 
added some code to Apollo so it could talk to uh, Kudu. And so even though uh, on the African savanna, the Kudus and Impala's don't get along, in, in, on a Hadoop cluster, they get along really well. And uh, so in general, their, their best practice uh, they recommend is to just run Kudu with HDFS. So you can set aside some disk space for Kudu and, and some for HDFS. And also you can, Kudu has data locality, so if you're on MapReduce or Spark, they will run on the same machines where the, uh, where the tablet is stored that your uh, MapReduce job is going to consume. Uh, the other thing that's different about Kudu is that it has a static schema. So unlike HBase, which is a complete NoSQL, uh, which has a NoSQL schema where you can add columns on, on the fly, uh, Kudu requires that you specify Columns much like the relational database, and so it supports uh, these primitive types. And also, the cells have to be small. So generally, the recommendation is to stay below 10 kilobytes. So this is not really intended for blobs or images, but more for just uh, records where you have uh, most of your column values are these cell cell types. Yeah. Is it per column or row? These are per. These are individual values. Okay. And it, so, the, in the current release, they, they don't, it might not even work, but in general, it's, it's not intended to work for very long, for very large uh, values. So these are all just column values. And then also, there's different uh, encoding types that you can specify on the schema. And this kind of squeezes the columnar metaphor even further. So, um, plain encoding is the default. Uh, you can also do bit shuffle encoding for integers and other bitwise, uh, other bit-oriented fields. And essentially, this is like columnar encoding for bits. So what it does is it just takes the, uh, it stores the most significant bit first, then the second most significant. So if you have a lot of values which are fairly similar with just some variation on the least significant bits, then you'll be able to uh, compact, to store them very compactly. So you'll end up when you compress them, you'll have a lot of repetition. And then also, uh, run length encoding is supported on fields. So if you have, this is something Parquet does as well, and kind of is part of the secret sauce of Parquet. So if you have the same IP address repeated 100 times, it'll just be stored once. And also, this is uh, something that's particularly useful for big data, because a lot of times, the data is not normalized. And so you're looking at log files and other uh, data sources where you have the same values for most of the columns. And so with run that length encoding, you can just uh, make the data much more compact, but also the scans are now going, going to be faster, because you're just going to read a single record, and you'll pick up all of the values. And there's also a couple of other types of encoding. So dictionary and prefix. And also, you can enable compression. And uh, compression is, it, I mean, it's a choice that you can make, and it kind of has this trade-off that it will shrink down your space, but it won't increase your performance. Whereas, run length encoding will generally tend to make things faster. All right, so I think, uh, yeah, Pete wanted us out by 30, so I think we'll, we'll be able to <laughs> land this on time. Uh, so we have a demo next. And uh, so for the demo, actually, let me just go through the slides first. So for the demo, you have to download the Cloudera Quick Start VM. Now, Kudu works on some other things as well, but that's like the best environment to kind of try it out first. And uh, also, if, when you install it, it comes up in VirtualBox, so you just have to open up a port so that you can look at the admin UI as well. So one of the nice things about Kudu is it's written by people who were on the professional services team in Cloudera, so they have a lot of experience with troubleshooting and debugging. So they've built in monitoring and uh, nice web UIs for admin so that you can see what's going on. And so this is, these are just some settings you have to do on VirtualBox to open up uh, the admin UI port. And so the admin UI runs on 8051. And then after that, you SSH into the quick start uh, machine if it's running on, uh, on VirtualBox with user, as user demo, and then the password is also demo and you start a PolyShell. And then after that, you create a table. Now, the 
interesting thing here is you, so we're creating a table with uh, state ID, sale date, store, product amount, and, uh, and this is an example of creating uh, tablets by the, uh, using a range. Uh, these are basically uh, using a range partition instead of a hash partition. So the syntax for hash partitioning as well, where you just specify that the column should be hashed and based on that, the tablets will produce. So this is gonna split up your uh, keys. It's gonna put three split points, so it's gonna create four tablets. So everything before California up to California, and then between California and Washington, and or actually between California and Oregon, and then Oregon and Washington. And then after that, you can insert some data into it, and, and then just run regular SQL. Uh, and then you want to look at it in the quick start UI. So I've actually run all these things already, and I was, uh, so I'm just going to, I think the insert is actually unfortunately also done. So I'm going to just do a select. So I'm already in, actually let me just at least do this part. So I'm going to SSH into, oh, you know what, I didn't realize. Uh, oh no, I think this should be okay. I don't have Wi-Fi, but I'm, I'm on my local machine, so it should be fine. Um, Maybe that wasn't a good idea. Okay, so um, let me just see if the if uh, this works. Okay, yeah. So this is working. So the uh, web UI is working, and uh, oh, this is working too. Okay, cool. Uh, so the only thing is you have to type Impala shell instead of Impala because that's that's what the shell is called. Uh, and now I can do things like show tables. And so I, I currently have one table, which is sales. I can do describe sales. And so you can see it has exactly the structure uh, that we expect. And also if you do describe formatted sales, it will, um, yeah, so this is going to wrap around. But you can see it has uh, all of the metadata that we passed in through sales. So it has a Kudu table name and a Kudu master address and all of the Kudu specific fields. And so now I can run uh, some of the Yeah, so now I can just uh, run uh, some of the, so the data should already be there and I can, I can just uh, run select account. Actually, let me save this one, so I'll, I'll, so I can do select account star sales. And so you can see that has six uh, elements and I can also do select uh, star from sales just to see what they are. So these are all the, the six records that I inserted. And then, uh, and you can run basically any query that Impala supports on this. So the only difference here is, it's sort of hitting Parquet, which Impala would normally do. This is uh, interacting with Kudu. And so you're getting comparable performance to what you'd get with uh, Parquet. Uh, at the same time, using the Java API, you are also able to do gets and puts and scans, just like HBase, on the same data. So that's kind of the, the big benefit. And then we can, uh, we can look at the web UI, the admin UI, which is uh, just on port 8051. And uh, this has um, the tables. And so there's, there's another table, which actually I deleted, but it, I dropped, but it's still showing up here. So I'm not sure why why that is. Uh, but if we go to the sales table, you can see that it has four tablets, which are uh, based on the ranges that I specified. And, uh, and then there's currently only one tablet server. And uh, this, these are all the different metrics that 
you have a mobile phone. Uh, so there are some command line tools as well that give you the uh, that you can use to extract metrics directly from from Kudu. What's the yeah. recommendation on the number of columns? Right. So actually, that's a good question. Now it doesn't. Uh, that's actually I'm not sure offhand, so I I would have to double check. But uh, it's uh, it does. Uh, it, I mean, in general, though, when you make queries, it only since the storage is columnar, it doesn't actually scan all the columns. It's only going to go to the specific uh, column that you're looking for. And also within the those files, when it stores the uh, the, the files on disk, uh, it will store it stores each column in a separate block. So, it, uh, so it's column by column. Separate. Right. So it, I mean, storing it in a columnar way. So it's it, it's a big file, but it has uh, a sequence of columns for from the first from the set of rows and then a second set of columns and so on, or the second column and the third column. So in general, it uh, should not have a I mean, it should have a pretty a high number of columns that you can have. But that's something I'll have to, I'll have to double check. And I think it'll require some like field experience as well with like using this. So right now, it might the behavior eventually might be much better than what it is right now. Uh, so I think the white paper is actually pretty good. It goes into a lot of the details. Uh, for the quick start VM, you can get the steps here and, and try this out. Uh, the schema document just talks about uh, the, the way you can create tables and how you specify the different encoding schemes. Uh, and then the Kudu and Pala guide is also pretty uh, useful. So I just wanted to just have a slide about the data engineering program again, and then just open it up to uh, questions. What, what, and that's, I mean, asking myself, why use this instead of something like uh, uh, Cassandra? Right, so Cassandra and H, so I used HBase and in here as the as the foil for like uh, you know low latency databases, but Cassandra and HBase are, are very similar. So Cassandra or HBase have the same issue where they're they're good at um, random access and also they give you readability, but they're not uh, they're not going to give you as uh, when you if you're running analytics, Parquet is going to be faster on HDFS just because you can if you run Hive for example. It, it's going to be much faster. So Hive, uh, I guess on, on Cassandra you have to run C, uh, uh, CQL or something like that, but it's still going to be, uh, it's not going to be as fast as Parquet. So the, the, main, the main advantage is it's kind of giving you both combinations. So Cassandra and HBase are, you know, there are some differences in their performance, but overall their, their architecture is pretty similar. Any other questions? I think Pete might have some more can openers. Uh, anyone wants? All right. Thanks. All right, well, thank you.